Welcome to the math record. Today we'll be learning about statistical concepts. This video will cover chapter 5 in our statistics class. In our previous chapters, we discussed how to determine the, us the usualness of something using different type of sampling uh, distributions, which is the uh, Z model, the T model, and the chi-square model. Well, that happened. Well, uh, now we're going to ask what happens when our stat tests are wrong. These are known as errors. And there are basically two types of them. Okay, so errors. There is type 1 error. And there is type 2 error. Okay, type 1 error would be if the null hypothesis, right? Our null hypothesis um was true but we said it was wrong we said was wrong you know and type 2 error would be if we said the alternative hypothesis was wrong when it's actually true so that so in type 2 the alternative hypothesis is true but we said it was wrong okay So there is actually a really easy way to remember this. So whenever you write a stat test, right, you ba you write the no hypothesis first, and then the alternative hypothesis second. So the type one error is when the t uh, f is when the first one is right. So the first one is the no hypothesis. So, um, but but when you were using your stats test, you you said it was wrong. So type two error would be if the second one is right because it's type two. Uh, so the alternative hypothesis is the right one, but then you said that one was wrong. Um, this is this is usually the way I remember it. It's pretty simple and it's pretty easy. So some of the reasons like why these uh, errors might be might occur would be is the sample size is like if your sorry if your sample size is too small, so your n is too small. Or if your sample is just bad. So your sample is bad. Um, for example, like, like if you had like an equal chance to get like a red or blue marble, right? In your sample and you somehow got like 25 red marbles out of like 30 marbles. Well, this is kind of unlike, while this probability is kind of unlikely, it's not really impossible. So... This is referred to as a bad sample because as you expect to get like the sample that kind of represents the proportions. So in this case, like you um you expect you to should get fifteen reds and fifteen blues, right? Because you should get, get you should get equal amount of reds and blues because they have equal a uh, chance to get it. But then you somehow got twenty five reds and five blues. So it's you just got a bad sample. So that's what it means. So going back to like the type one and uh, type two error. There really isn't a mathematical way to know if uh, your if your stat test gave you the wrong answer. You just know that it kind of has to exist. A lot of these stats concepts, you just have to know that they exist, but you can't really like prove them. You just have to say they're likely or they're not likely, and you have to know that they're like basically there. Okay, and usually uh, when you have like a stat test, you only can have one or you can only have one or two errors. So you either say your no hypothesis is true and that was wrong, or your alternative hypothesis was true and that was wrong. That's there's only those two types of errors, right? So type one and type two error. So you can't have two errors at the same time. Generally. Okay. Another term we're gonna learn is called the power of the test. Power of the test. The power of the test is basically the probability that you reject the null hypothesis. So it's the probability um, you reject the null hypothesis, like on, in a stats test. So basically the general idea is that if you increase your alpha level, 
Because remember in our tests in like chapters 2, 3, and 4, we use alpha level of around uh, 0.05, right? Well, if we increase this alpha level to like, you know, to like 0.2, uh, right? Um, then basically, um, your power of your test also increase. So, if you increase your power of the test, I mean, if you increase your, uh, alpha level, you increase your power of the test. Because, like, think about it. Since anything below the alpha level, you would consider unusual, um, and thus reject the, uh, null hypothesis. Since the prob since the power is the probability that you reject the null, then basically the power of the test is equal to the alpha level. So if you increase the alpha level, then you increase the power of the test. Similarly, if you like decrease the alpha level, right, then you also decrease the test. Just know basically this general I this general like concept that if you increase the alpha level, and you that means you increase the power of the test. That's a general idea you just need to know for the power of the test. Okay. Let's erase this. And another thing is that if you increase your alpha level, uh, going back to like the type 1 and type 2 errors, if you increase your alpha level, your type 1 error increases. Right? Your type 1 error increases. I'll just write on a new, on a new document. I'm running out of space. If you increase your alpha level, right, increase your alpha level, then you increase your type 1 error. And you decrease your type 2 error. Because type 1 error and type 2 error kind of like works like opposites usually. So if you increase type 1, you decrease type 2. If you, in if you decrease type 1, then you increase type 2. So you kind of have different effects all the time. And then, um... If, so if you increase alpha level, you increase uh, type uh, one error. Your your type one error increase and your type two error decrease. Similar, if you decrease your alpha level, right? You uh, you decrease type one error and you increase type two error. Right, because type one error is um, basically um, the that you that that the no hypothesis was. Uh, was true, but we rejected it, right? So type 1 error is the probability that we rejected. And that's why it increases, because it kind of like basically have the same uh, concept. Okay. So. Just knowing the idea is basically okay. Usually people get confused about the relationship between type 1 error, type 2 error, and the power of the test. Just know that if you increase your type, your alpha level, right? That means your type 1 error increases and your type 2 error decreases. And also your type, your power of your test increases. So this is the general rule. Power of the test, right, also increases. So also similarly, right, if you decrease like alpha level, then you decrease type 1, but you increase type 2, but you decrease power of the test, basically. It's just a bunch of terms that you want, you might want to know the errors, the power of the test. Okay. And now let's, um, so if you want to also, so why I said there was a general, the general idea is that if you increase type one error and you, that means you decrease type two error or if you decrease type one and you increase type two, that they have like opposite effect each other. Sometimes they might have the same effect on each other. So if you want to lower, uh, type, if you want to lower type 1 uh, error. Oh, sorry. I don't know I wrote that far. If you want to lower type 1 error. And you also um, want to lower type 2 error, right? Uh, you want to lower both of them. What you do is that you increase the sample size. So you just increase n. So if you increase the sample size, then you lower type 1 and type 2 error. Because uh, remember how you're calculating standard deviation and standard error? You ha um, the higher n you have, basically there is um, less variation because like the standard deviation gets smaller, right? So if the standard deviation gets smaller, that means your error answer becomes more precise because it's close because the spread is less um, spread out from the mean. 
So it gets closer to the mean. So let's say you have a spread. You have a mean of like 0, right? And you have a spread of 1. That means 1 standard deviation away means that uh, your number is between um, negative 1 and 1, right? Because uh, 0 minus 1 and 0 plus 1. So it's between these numbers. But if, you're, uh, if you have a higher n, that means it, the standard deviation like might turn out to become uh, like 1 half. So then the deviation, the, where the um, number might be is between like negative 1 half and 1 half. So it gets um, clustered together. So there is, so you're more precise about your answer. That means your type, er that means your errors just generally go down. So type 1 error and type 2 error generally just goes down. So you want to decrease both, you just uh, increase your n. If you want to um, increase, if you want to just, uh, if you just want to um, affect a one or the one of type one error or type two error, just one of them, like one goes up and one goes down, then you basically just uh, do something to your alpha level and you basically just follow the general rule that I said uh, like a few minutes or seconds prior. Okay. So let's learn another concept, which is called the effect size. Okay, effect size is basically the difference between the null hypothesis and the uh, true value. So the difference between um, the null hypothesis and the true value. So what does this mean? Well, let's take for example, like a company states that 20 of their marbles are red, right? So if they say 20% is red, and, um, but in reality, it's actually 30%. We actually can't find the number, uh, like, uh, in reality, but let's say in, uh, uh, that in reality, it actually is 30%. Then the difference, the effect size is that 10%, right? Because it's 30 minus the 20. So it's that 10%. Um, the general idea for effect size is that, uh, if you have a larger effect size, you have a larger power of the test. So if you have a larger effect size, you have a larger power of the test. Right? Because generally, um, when, um, the how I explain this is that, like, let's say you have a normal model, right? The, sorry, I forgot the line. Yeah, something like this. Right? And this is where you think the mean is. Like, that's the no hypothesis. But the true value is, like, right here. Right? So, generally, this is where you think the normal model is centered. But actually, the normal model is actually, like, right here. You know? Sorry about that. Okay. Right? So, that's the normal model. So let's say your area for like um to reject it is right here, right? So whatever you reject it as. So that's your area for this graph basically. So that's let's say your alpha level is like right there, and you basically that's where you're gonna reject it. So if you have a larger effect size, right? So this is the true value. We'll call it t. Then basically, if you increase the effect size. Generally, if you have, like, let's say you have another picture, right? If you increase it even more, you have it right here, okay? Right, if you increase it even more, then basically that difference, uh, because it's basically, um, you have to look for that difference in between. So technically, the, the area gets smaller and smaller. So it kind of, just know that the general idea is that if you have a larger effect size, then basically it has a um, has a uh, has a higher power of the test. So that's the general idea, and th and that's why it works with that picture because like if you have the normal model right and you have the no hypothesis and the um, true value, then as the um, and you in the area is like basically where they share where they share to like reject the right, is where the null hypothesis and the true value is where they reject the, um, the value. So as this moves over, right, 
as this moves even more to the um to the right because it's the difference is getting bigger, right? So I have something like this. Right, it gets even smaller, then this area gets even smaller because instead of calculating for all those area that's like similar to both of them, then it's then as it gets smaller, right? It's generally the um the area for like a normal model, right, gets uh smaller each time, right? So this area right here is smaller than this area right here, you know? I mean, it's bigger than this area right here. So this area right here is smaller than this area right here. So if this area is moving more to the right, then basically that area is getting smaller. So, um, so if your area is getting smaller, that means you're making that probability, uh, you're making that probability less likely to occur. So that's what is defined as your power of the test. So since it's less likely to occur, that means um, if the probability that you uh, reject it will kind of get higher. So technically, you have a if you have a larger effect size, you have a higher power of the test. But if that's if that's too complicated. Basically, just know that if you uh, the general idea is that if you increase the power, uh, increase your uh, effect size, you have a, a larger power of the test. And the final concept we're going to learn is how to find the uh, right alpha level for the confidence interval, which is um, basically um, the general idea is that like if you have, there's two types of like tests, right? So when we're using the T model and the Z model for chapter two and three, sorry, that's a bad graph, okay? right? We have like two kinds. If it's less than or greater than, so if it's greater than, it has the area right here, right? And if it's the less than, it's just right here. But if it's um, but if it's not equal to right for the alternative hypothesis, it's both sides, right? So if it's if it's either on the right or the left side, that's called a one-sided test. And if it's on both sides, which is the not equal to, is a two-sided test, right? You see why? Because there's two of them, and one side is just one. You see a greater than or less than. Then um, then basically there's a general uh, relationship between alpha level and uh, confidence interval. So if you use like some kind of like specific alpha level, that means you should technically use a specific confidence interval. Generally, you don't have to do it, but uh, if you if you want to find the correct um, value, technically this is this is the way you had to do it. So um, the general idea is that if you have a one sided, right? Let's let's say we have a one sided. If you have a one sided. Um, uh, uh, if your stat test is one-sided, so if your hypo your alternative hypothesis is either greater than or less than, uh, is that greater than or less than symbol, then your confidence interval, right, your confidence interval is going to be equal to, um, one minus twice the alpha level. Okay. And if your, uh, test is two-sided, then your confidence interval is equal to 1 minus the alpha level. So let's kind of try out an example. So let's say you had a one-sided 95% confidence interval, right? That means you have a 95% confidence. Uh, it's, you usually have to write it in a decimal, so 95% is 0.95. So 1 minus uh, 2 um, alpha level. That means uh, uh, 1 minus 9.5 is 0 0.05 is equal to 2 uh, alpha level. So your alpha level is equal to 0 0.025, right? So your alpha level, when uh, if you have a 95% uh, confidence interval, that means you have a 2.5% um, alpha level, right? Which is 0 0.025, right? So it's 0 0.025. Usually for alpha levels, you write it as a decimal, but you can also write it as percentage if you want. And if you have a 95% of confidence for a two-sided, that means your alpha level is just 5%, right? Because confidence, 1 minus that confidence, which is 0.95. For the, um, for the alpha level. So you have a 5% alpha. See how they're different? Because for a one-sided, it's basic. For a one-sided versus a two-sided, that two-sided alpha level is twice the amount of the, um, it's twice the amount for the alpha level for the one-sided. Uh, so that's why there's a, like a difference between one-sided uh, test and two-sided test. An easy way to remember this is basically uh, you have to, 
if you had to do a 95% confidence, right? So this is 95%, that area under this is 95. Then you on, if you're doing a one-sided, you only do this side, or you only do this side. So you only have to find the area of 1. So the area of 1 of them is just 2.5, right? And if you had to do the area for a two-sided test, then this is 95, right? That means you have to find... A two-sided test is that you have to find both. So since both of them is 2.5, just add the 2.5 to get to get 5. And that's how you remember it. Just know how many... Like, what's that area of that one thing that you have to look for. Because if it's uh, one-sided, which is less than or equal to for less than... Uh, less than... The, for the or greater than for the alternative hypothesis, then basically you just, um, you basically just look for one minus two times the alpha level to equal your confidence interval. And if it's two sided, which is not equal to, it's just one minus the alpha level to get your confidence interval. Okay, so that basically covers the statistical concepts. So for statistical concepts, we learn type one error, type two error power of the test, uh, and effect size, and the relationship between alpha level and confidence interval. Now let's move on to like understanding what does the p-value or confidence interval mean. So let me erase this. Okay. So first up, the p-value. So we're going to find out what does the p-value or confidence interval mean. Because when we're using a hypothesis test, we have a p-value, and when we have a confidence interval, we need to find out what that means. Because when we were using for our tests, we were really specific about the p-value and confidence interval. And we, so now we're going to understand what does it mean technically in general. So we have a p-value, okay? A p-value is the probability uh, of obtaining as a result as extreme as our example, assuming that the no hypothesis is true. So, um, the pro it's basically the probability of, of obtaining, sorry, I thought, thought that wrong, obtaining a result as extreme as our sample, right? As our sample, if our null hypothesis is true, if our HO is true, basically. So, let's say for example, like uh, the company claims that that twenty percent of their uh, marbles are red, right? But our sample has a mean of thirty percent. So the company claims they have a twenty percent red, but our sample gives us a thirty percent. Right, uh, I'll just label this as C for a company and S for a sample, right? Then, uh, let's say our, um, hypothetically, our p-value is, uh, our p-value, I'll just write it as p, is equal to 0.1, right? So, that, uh, so overall, that basically means that we have a 10% because of that 0.1 for our p-value. That means uh, we have a 10% uh, chance of seeing a sample that gives us a 30% red marbles if the companies claim that 20% of the red marbles are true. That's basically the general idea of like the p-value. So it's the probability of obtaining, so the probability of obtaining like uh, a, a result as extreme as that 30%, you know? Like how extreme, like how unusual it is to get this 30% when the mean is uh, 20%, uh, I'm, get 30% if uh if the 20% is the mean is is the mean that they claim to be true you know and basically p is a probability so that's the probability it has a 10% chance of obtaining a result as uh extreme as this 30% if the 20% thing is true okay so that's the general idea for the p value now let's move on to the confidence interval Well, uh, the confidence interval is the percentage of uh, samples that, of that size that were produced confidence interval that captures the true proportion of basically what you're measuring. So it's the percentage. So in general, it basically means the percentage of uh, samples of that size. That size that capture, um, let's just say half, the 
true proportion the true proportion sorry um okay. the true proportion of uh of what you're measuring you are measuring you know okay so let's say for example uh um let's say you have a 95 percent confidence interval for a sample size of 30 and uh and you use that to find like the proportion of red marbles right that means uh in that 95 percent uh that that means in 95% of those random samples of size 30, right? Because you're using a size 30. Because this will have a different uh, number. If the confidence interval uh, will have a different number if it's a different size, sample size, right? Because a sample size 30 is different from a sample size of like 50 or 100, you know? Because like, as I said, if you increase the sample size, you increase the, you decrease the spread, which is the standard deviation, right? Because like, it's basically always the standard deviation and standard error and standard error is basically smaller because of uh, the uh, n, so which is usually just divide by n or divide by square root n or something like that. There's usually something with dividing by n, right? Something with n. So generally, it will get smaller, right? So you increase the amount of n, then you basically decrease the uh, standard error. So the um, so if that's why you have a uh for those random samples of the same size, so. That means in that 95% of those random samples of size 30, right, of those size 30, the true proportion of red marbles will be, uh, will be in those confidence interval. So in, like, so you have a, if, so what I'm saying is that if you have a 95% confidence interval from a sample size of 30, right, if you follow, then basically, um, the true proportion of those red marbles will only be in 95% of those random samples. And those all and all those samples has to be sample size thirty. That basically, uh, like, is the general idea for like the confidence interval of what is measuring. Okay. So that basically covers the confidence interval. Uh, and overall, that basically covers the statistical concepts. So that ca completes chapter five or statistics class. So in general, in this class, uh, in chapter one, right. You learned about surveys, you learned about observations, and you learned about experiments. Okay. And also, um, you learned about uh, the geometric, uh, geometric uh, probability and the binomial probability. And also in that chapter, you were introduced the idea of standard deviation. I just read that SD and the idea of means. So shape, center, and spread. Remember that? In chapter two, okay, let me have a new slide. In chapter two, um, you learned about the, uh, the first sampling distribution, which is the Z model the Z model, right? Which works for proportions. And you also learned about that confidence interval. And in that, that basically includes the one proportion and the two proportion Z test. And chapter three, right? You learned about the T model, which works for means and averages. And in there, you kind of learn you learned about the one sample t test, the uh, two sample t test, and the pair t test. And in chapter four, you learned about the final sampling distribution, which is the chi squared, which is for uh, comparing distributions. So if you're given like charts, basically, so you have charts. Because while t model and z model could also have charts. Uh, chi square would be measuring basically distribution, like the actual distribution from those charts. Um, and in the chi square model, we basically included goodness of fit, so the GOF, the chi square test of homogeneity, and the chi square test of independence. And finally, in this chapter, you learn about statistical concepts to explain these uh, 
that explain the sampling distribution, the T model, the, uh, the Z model, the T model, and the chi-square model, right? So that includes type 1 error, type 2 error, power of the test, and the effect size. Okay, so overall, while this class has covered a lot, there's still a va vast amount of concepts that we didn't cover, which um, the math uh, record won't be covering anytime soon in this uh, class. Uh, this is not because uh, we don't want to teach them, but because we feel it's unnecessary f to know for now. For example, a concept we aren't going to be covering would be uh, regressions, even though it's pretty important for statistics generally. Um, if you want to learn more about regressions, there's a link in the description below that will, re that will redirect you to a site if you want to learn more about it. Well, that basically covers everything for our statistics class. Congratulations on completing the math records statistics class. Uh, thanks for watching, and I'll catch you at the next math record.